Tonight, countries around the world are dealing with angry residents as COVID restrictions are being reinstated as a winter COVID surge is taking hold. This was a scene in Belgium over the weekend. Authorities used a water cannon on demonstrators who were unhappy with mandatory four day a week work from home, vaccine passports and face mask requirements. Tonight, the horrifying new images emerging of that holiday parade horror. The red SUV speeding through a crowd of people plowing into a marching band. At least five people were killed, more than 40 injured, six children now in critical condition. The startling new information we're learning about the suspect. Tonight, the Ahmad Arbery trial moves toward a new phase, jury deliberations. Both sides making their closing arguments, the prosecutor urging the jury to use common sense, telling them the three white men shot and killed Arbery, quote, the defense claims the defendants were trying to make a citizen's arrest even though Arbery had not stolen anything. Jury deliberations are expected to begin tomorrow. Next, you may already be back in your office or making plans to return, but tonight some members of Congress are still literally phoning it in, invoking an emergency COVID remote voting policy, and critics say a surprising number of lawmakers are skipping town and sometimes attending other functions. We went to Capitol Hill to seek answers. I can call your music. But you voted proxy many times after you said it was a bad idea. Again, I don't do all the interviews. Tonight, the smash and grab problem in San Francisco. Huge crowds of thieves swarm stores. 80 people accused of looting a Nordstrom. Up to 100 people emptying stores from Walgreens to Louis Vuitton. For Americans looking to score Black Friday deals legally, we've got you covered tonight. The tips to get the best price and when you should consider buying. Tonight, our journey to beautiful Iceland, the climate change fighting machine there, sucking pollution out of the sky, hoping this technology makes a huge dent in the rapid warming of our planet. And really, Iceland is the ideal place to do this because all of this is being run. If we were running this with coal-fired electricity, it would be so yeah. backward. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight in Wisconsin with the fallout after a treasured celebration of the holiday season in a tight-knit community turned into a scene of grief and horror. We're getting a look at new images of a driver plowing into the Waukesha Christmas Parade late Sunday afternoon, getting new accounts of just how horrifying it was to witness it firsthand. The fire chief comparing the scene to a war zone. This was the 58th Christmas parade for the community there. The annual event was canceled last year because of the pandemic. The theme of this year's event was comfort and joy. Among the victims, members of Milwaukee's Dancing Grannies, an amateur dance group for grandmas that have been a staple at the parade for decades. In a Facebook post, the group said in part, those who died were extremely passionate grannies. Their eyes gleamed joy of being a granny. They were the glue that held us together. And tonight we're learning more about the suspect, including the fact that just days ago, he was released from jail. Our Alex Perez leads us off tonight from Wisconsin. Tonight, horrifying new images showing that SUV swerving through the crowd in Waukesha, Wisconsin, ramming into members of a marching band at the Christmas parade. Oh my God! Get out the way! Maroon Ford escapes his blue bike heading into the parade road. From holiday smiles to indescribable fear, these images from above showing entire families, children, and participants like the dancing grannies desperately trying but unable to escape the vehicle's path. There's like seven injured that way. There's so many down there. Matthew Rood was with his two girls, ages two and five. Seconds before the incident, they wanted some of the candy being handed out. She said, Daddy, can I go get that piece of candy? And I said, no, honey, you stay by me. I don't go past this line, OK? And there's a reason why I said that, OK? And not even a minute later, that's exactly where the SUV drove by. I can't find her! Person after person mowed down, five people killed, at least 48 injured, including 18 children, six still in critical condition. There was just like so many like bodies in the road um, and then I saw them like start to pick them up and they were like little kids. Terrified many screaming for loved ones. For more than a third of a mile down Main Street, that vehicle slamming into people. Dan Schneiderman's record shop is on the parade route. About 60 people ran in to seek refuge. He helped to perform first aid on some of the injured. I literally saw 
roughly 10 people bounce off of that car and and you could hear thud 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 as he drove through that and you could hear it uh, which is a sound I'll never forget. Authorities tonight identifying the driver of that SUV as 39 year old Daryl Brooks arrested and charged with five counts of first degree intentional homicide. Officials say just back on November 2nd Brooks was accused of using what appears to be the same vehicle to run over the mother of his child. Investigators believe before the parade incident he was fleeing another crime scene possibly a domestic disturbance. Police say he was not being pursued when he rammed the parade barricades and and unleashed havoc. I want to identify the victims that we've at that we know of at this time. And I see this with great sorrow. The police chief emotional as he identified the victims and described those who helped. Minutes after an incident occurred, I responded to the scene, and what I saw out of chaos and tragedy was heroes. Tonight, authorities identifying those tragically killed, four women and one man, ages 52 to 81. Among them, Tammy Durand, her husband tonight telling ABC News her memory will bring joy to all who knew her. So much despair. Alex Perez joins us now from Waukesha. Alex, a vigil is taking place tonight. What more can you tell us about the mood in the community right now? Yeah, Lindsay, it might be hard to tell behind me here, but there are actually hundreds of people who have been standing out here in the cold for about an hour now at this point. This community really remains in shock, trying to process everything that has happened, but they're doing what we see here, coming together and trying to support each other, Lindsay. And to try and get through this time. And Alex, as you reported, the suspect has a lengthy criminal history. Authorities now taking a close look at his prior convictions. Yeah, Lindsay, authorities say they do not believe this is a case of terrorism, but they are taking a very close look at the suspect's criminal record, including that case referenced in our story about uh, earlier this month where he was accused of using a car to run over the mother of his child. He's due in court here tomorrow afternoon, Lindsay. Alex Perez, thank you. Now to the closing arguments in the Ahmad Arbery case. The prosecutor told the jury that the three men shot and killed Arbery because he was a black man running. The defense, though, says it was self-defense and that Travis McMichael, who pulled the trigger, did so in fear for his life. Here's ABC's Steve Osinsami. One of the first things the prosecutor drove home as she began her closing arguments today is that the issue of color really mattered. All three of these defendants made assumptions made assumptions about what was going on that day, and they made their decision to attack Ahmaud Arbery in their driveways because he was a black man running down the street. She said it was three on one with their guns and pickup trucks versus an unarmed young black man who wasn't even carrying a cell phone or a wallet. If you are the initial unjustified aggressor, you don't get to claim self-defense. If you're committing a felony against somebody, you don't get to claim self-defense. And the third one is if you provoke somebody so that they defend themselves against you, and then you go, oh, look, he attacked me first. But you really were the one who was provoking the attack on yourself. You don't get to claim self-defense. Defense lawyers told jurors that this killing was self-defense because when they look at this same disturbing cell phone video from that sunny February day nearly two years ago, they see the victim trying to overpower their client and take his gun. And so he's done what he thinks the law allows him to do, which is to try to de-escalate that approach by showing force. Showing force necessary to prevent Travis himself or his father from getting beaten and possibly killed. And so he raises the gun and he does it to defend himself. Travis McMichael, who fired the fatal shots, his father Gregory McMichael, who was also armed that day, and their neighbor William Roddy Bryan, who police say joined the chase and recorded the video, have all pleaded not guilty. They're hoping that they've convinced jurors that they were making a citizen's arrest under then Georgia law. But prosecutors told jurors that the law requires the men to have immediate knowledge of something that Ahmaud Arbery did wrong, and none of them saw him steal anything at the neighborhood construction site. Even in these security camera videos, he's never seen taking or touching anything. 
unlike a few of the white visitors at the same construction site. But lawyers for the three men say their clients aren't racists and that Travis McMichael was devastated at the scene. If this was a case about wanting to murder a black jogger, if this was really a case about that, Travis would not have reacted the way he reacted. Steve Osinsami joins us now. Steve, this case has been explosive pretty much from the start, to say the least. You caught up with members of Aubrey's family today. What did they have to say about it all? So we caught up with his father and his father's attorney, Ben Crump, who have been watching this, of course, every day, watching it very closely, studying the faces of jurors, you know, as they're hearing the closing arguments today. One of the things that they both told me is that they are concerned that their son is being demonized in front of the jury. Try to just make him look like he was so bad when he wasn't. You know, he didn't do nothing wrong. Ain't no laws he broke. And the way they keep talking about burglary, wasn't never no burglary, you know, that's just, that just bad. Uh, they both told me they're quite concerned about this argument that they've seen in so many of these cases, this argument about crime and the concern that people have about crime and whether or not a neighborhood where people are worried about thefts or burglaries uh, might give any jurors who are of that feeling a sense that the shooting might have been justified because of that. Lindsay. And, and Steve, what are the next steps? So tomorrow, the uh, defense attorney, the prosecutor actually, continues her closing arguments, the second part of her closing arguments, it's her rebuttal. She's already promising that she's going to use the whole two hours that she is given. Then the judge will give the jury instructions and then the jury begins deliberating. It will be put in the jury's hands at that point. And that's probably gonna happen sometime tomorrow afternoon. Lindsay. So many already on pins and needles in anticipation of this verdict. Steve Osinsami, our thanks to you. For more on this, we bring in ABC News contributor Shauna Lloyd, an attorney with the Cochran Firm. Thanks so much for joining us, Shauna. We heard that argument from the prosecution that these men killed Ahmaud Arbery because he was a black man running. How persuasive was that to you after following this trial so closely? I think it's going to be quite persuasive because even amongst their own testimonies, the only thing that they are really addressing as to why they felt that he was suspicious was this previous encounter and then these videos that they said they had all this suspicious behavior in the neighborhood. And I think that that's not going to carry through for a jury because people want to be secure in the fact that when you are detaining someone, this person is the person that is committing whatever crime it may be. And none of the McMichaels or Mr. Bryant could point to some actual evidence as to why they thought he was being suspicious. And let's drill down on the self-defense argument here. The prosecution said that these men cannot claim self-defense because they provoke the encounter, but it's really more nuanced than that, right? Absolutely. I think there's a number of differences. Let's start with what we call stand your ground, which is you have the right to use deadly force to protect yourself anywhere you need to be. Now, that does not hold across all states. Some states confine that only to your home, and others actually have a duty to retreat if you can safely. So there's a lot of nuances to this self-defense. The other thing is that there's a few areas in which self-defense cannot be used. You cannot use it if you initially provoke the interaction, which is why we see them really focusing on the citizen's arrest law because that's the only thing that would give them the ability to have stopped him in the first place. And so you can't provoke it and you also can't be in process of a felony or anything else when you choose to say that you are having to defend yourself. And another of other instances that make self-defense a very case-by-case -case basis. And we've talked, of course, a lot about the Kyle Rittenhouse trial that just ended with a not guilty verdict. In that case, the defense was able to convince a jury that Rittenhouse was not the instigator, that at first he was the one being chased and attacked. Compare and contrast for us why that specific defense might work in Rittenhouse and potentially not here. I think when we're looking at Rittenhouse versus the McMichaels and Bryant trial, what we see in Rittenhouse is that there was a period of time where he was um, allegedly given these threats against him. There were people that were coming to harm him. When he uh, was initially attacked, he was chased, even if it was with a 
plastic bag, he himself didn't necessarily know what was in the plastic bag. So he ran and then he had nowhere to go. So in that case, I think the jury saw that he didn't necessarily provoke what happened, but that rather he was the subject of someone chasing him and him being in fear of his life. When it comes to the McMichaels and Bryant trial, what we're looking at is that Ahmad actually never says anything to them. He never approaches them. He never does anything but run. And here they are actually engaging him first. They are trying to pin him with the cars and then they get out of the car to engage with him with the shotgun as they are allegedly saying that they just wanted information. But it's a series of events that leads us to make the determination and will lead the jury to make the determination whether or not self-defense is applicable. In your opinion, what arguments from today are most likely to stick with the jurors? You know, interesting, at first you're looking at these three um, arguments from the defense side as individual arguments. But if what you if you look at them holistically, what you see is that the first argument on behalf of Travick McMichaels really humanized him. They wanted you to identify with him as an ex-military. They wanted you to understand that he's helped people in the past and that he would have never been out here for those things. Then the second argument on behalf of Greg McMichaels, what we saw was the victim blaming. They attacked Ahmad Aubrey himself. Why he was there, what he, his appearance was, you know, the fact that he had the whole neighborhood in fear, even though he hadn't actually been accused of anything. And then in the final argument, what we see is this idea that Mr. Goth brought up, that this was uh, God's calling on Mr. Bryant's life and him separating Mr. Bryant from Mr. McMichaels. So it's interesting, I think, but the broad strokes are really what the jury's going to remember. We saw the judge even had to let the jury out a little early because they were completely uh, done with closing arguments. So I think they take away the broad strokes of each argument. Shauna Lloyd, thank you so much, as always. Always a pleasure, Lindsay. Next to the new actions being taken by the House Select Committee investigating the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Five more subpoenas were issued to people involved in the Stop the Steal rallies, among them Roger Stone, a longtime Trump ally and conspiracy theorist Alex Jones. Stone says that he has yet to receive the subpoena and denies any responsibility for the violence of January 6th. As more Americans take the step toward vaccines and booster shots before the holiday weekend, some are experiencing some hiccups in the road to protection. This is COVID cases are once again on the rise. Our Stephanie Ramos brings us this report. With Thanksgiving just days away, Americans now racing to get a booster shot. Being able to see my family and not worry about um, getting them sick. Since that green light from the CDC, three million booster shots have gone into arms over the last three days. Boosting people's overall protection against COVID-19 disease and death was important to do now. But it took a while for some to find a shot, like New York City teacher Peggy Rodriguez. Did that concern you that you may not have as much protection as you're going to work as you did a few months earlier? Absolutely. Um, just being more around vulnerable populations like young children, um, I wanted to get that as soon as possible. Various pharmacies to figure out which ones were going to have it. It was really frustrating. It comes as millions of Americans fly for the Thanksgiving weekend, but administration officials insist there will be no impact to holiday travel after reporting 93% of TSA workers have either gotten the vaccine or asked for an exemption. Overall, 90% of the nation's 3.5 million federal workers have gotten at least one shot. Stephanie Ramos joins us now. Stephanie, new numbers are out today about children and COVID. What's the latest? Exactly, Lindsay. State officials are reporting an increase in COVID cases among children. For instance, in Massachusetts, the highest infection rate per capita is among five to nine year olds, Lindsay. Stephanie Ramos, thank you so much. Next to the desperate search for more than a dozen kidnapped Americans and a Canadian, two members of the Ohio-based missionary group have been released. The rest are still being held hostage and have been for more than a month at this point, with a violent gang demanding a million dollars ransom per person in order to let them go. The two freed, according to the missionary group, are said to be safe and in good spirits. The State Department says the U.S. is deeply engaged in freeing the remaining 15. Now to the increasing number of brazen robberies across the country. Large groups of people wearing masks and mobbing popular stores, stealing thousands of dollars worth of goods. The problem especially bad in the San Francisco Bay Area. And tonight, California's governor is weighing in and demanding accountability. Kaylee Hartung reports. 
Tonight, a rash of smash and grab thefts targeting retailers around the country just as the holiday shopping season picks up. In California, the Bay Area suddenly seeing mobs of people ambushing stores. A lot of them are going in there grabbing as much merchandise as they can and getting away. Over the weekend in Walnut Creek, 80 thieves storming a Nordstrom. Some even assaulting employees before they ran out with merchandise in hand to getaway cars. Probably saw 50 to 80 people in like ski masks, crowbars, night, like a bunch of weapons. And in San Francisco, more than a million dollars in merchandise was stolen after as many as 100 people rushed several stores, including this Louis Vuitton. Look, I have no sympathy, no empathy whatsoever. People smashing and grabbing, stealing people's items, creating havoc and terror on our streets. Tonight, the governor lashing out at the recent spate of crimes. We want real accountability. We want people prosecuted and we want people to feel safe. Kaylee Hartung joins us now. Kaylee, Black Friday, of course, right around the corner. Is there a concern about thieves striking while stores are packed with shoppers? Yeah, Lindsay, and throughout the holiday season, Governor Newsom is telling shoppers across California that they should expect to see an increased police presence around shopping centers. Lindsay? Kaylee Hartung, thanks to you. And when we come back, the terrifying scene caught on surveillance, a dump truck slamming into a home. What happened next? Elizabeth Holmes back on the stand in her high-stakes Theranos trial. Rebecca Jarvis was in court and will join us with how this former Silicon Valley favorite tried to defend herself today. But up next, how some lawmakers in Congress are using the pandemic as an excuse to do things like go to SpaceX launches or fundraise instead of showing up to vote. Our investigation is coming up next. This is what being live is Freeze all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. Run, urgent delivery run. Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. <laughs> Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> I you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. This is American history, a violent white mob, a brutal attack, 300 black Americans killed right here in America. Now, it is time to uncover Tulsa's buried truth, the gripping story brought to light in a new podcast from ABC News, available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Sex, gambling, fraud, betrayal, and murder. Cutthroat Inc., the podcast. Me the a family truth. on a mission to find their son. A year's worth of conversations with the killer. Cutthroat Inc., subscribe for free now on your favorite podcast app. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. Now with so much on the line, more Americans are turning to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight than any other program across all of television. Ohio authorities are trying to piece together what led to this deadly highway accident in that state. Five people were killed and two badly injured in Newberry after a van that they were in collided into a tractor trailer. The tractor trailer driver was also injured but is expected to recover.
Next, you may be already back in your office or making plans to return, but what about your member of Congress? A surprising number of lawmakers are still invoking an emergency COVID policy to vote remotely in the House, an option not available in the Senate. But now critics say a surprising number of lawmakers are skipping town, voting by proxy, and in some cases attending other in-person events. Our senior Washington reporter Devin Dwyer went looking for answers on Capitol Hill. As major votes are cast, the Build Back Better bill is passed. Dozens of members of Congress are literally phoning it in. As the member designated by Mr. Swalwell, I inform the House that Mr. Swalwell will vote aye. Doing their jobs by proxy vote, citing an ongoing public health emergency, even as COVID-19 recedes. They don't want to come in unless they are vaccinated and unless others are vaccinated. 343 members of the House, Democrats and Republicans, have filed a notice to vote remotely at least once this year, telling the House clerk they're unable to physically attend proceedings because of the pandemic. Good paying green jobs. At Friday's historic vote on the $1.75 trillion Build Back Better plan, 98 lawmakers who voted didn't show up in person. Figuring out how to um, prevent abuse of the practice while also making it available for people who need it is a, it's a real challenge. Enforcement is by honor system, and critics say many absences have nothing to do with the pandemic, instead are matters of politics and convenience. Graph the number of proxies and look how they increase exponentially on Fridays, right? Nearly all House Republicans opposed proxy voting when it began last year, but some have since taken advantage. And I will stand up for your God-given rights every single day. Congresswoman Lauren Boebert of Colorado, among 13 Republicans who voted remotely while attending a political conference. Why have you done it? You know. Get in the car with me or what? I believe that... Republican Congressman Madison Cawthorn of North Carolina was also there. He's voted by proxy more than a dozen times this year. I inform the House that Mr. Cawthorn will vote no. Despite blasting Democrats who've used remote voting as cowards for not showing up. I don't know what you But you voted proxy many times after you said it was a bad idea. Again, I don't do all interviews. Hypocritical that so many of your colleagues on your side have used it after... No. Criticizing Look, I think once you make the rules, people follow the rules. Rule or not, top Republicans say proxy voting is unconstitutional. House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy even asking the Supreme Court to strike it down. I think people should be here to work, to have to be paid. Uh, when you don't, when you proxy vote, you're not here to debate the bill. Um, you're not in committee. Um, you you don't condemned have it early on. Yeah, it's wrong. Why are so many Republicans participating in proxy voting still? I think people should, uh, well, if you have, if you look at how many Democrats, there's Democrats who have never been back to work. That's not true, according to the House clerk, but Democrats have used the practice too. I didn't want to expose my members. Sometimes for COVID-19, sometimes for reasons that are less clear. They've never offered to buy my I was going to say. Democratic Congressman Ron Kind of Wisconsin voted remotely on seven bills in June while President Biden was visiting his state. It's a good thing when you have legitimate reasons to be away. I have two young girls. Um, there You've are times when times. I have because um, I, I used it uh, when, they, when my daughter was born. Others have used remote voting while caring for a sick or dying parent or when flight delays have kept them stranded, but each time citing COVID for being unable to attend. What if it's a good reason, like the birth of a child or one of your Republican colleagues had okay. eye surgery? My my wife had our first child 60 months ago. I missed votes. That, that's how it was. You, you miss votes for legitimate reasons. But proxy voting basically gets us closer to a non-essential Congress or a Congress that's just... You know, zooming into work every day. Here's the member designated by Mr. Trone of Maryland. Congressman Don Beyer of Virginia, who regularly casts votes for absent Democratic colleagues, says it's about time everyone gets back to debating and voting in person. The original purpose was just for people who either where it was just wasn't safe to fly or they had uh, some pre-existing condition, including being too old. Um, now, when people start going to conferences or something, that's that's a, a little different. Rocket launches. Yeah, yeah. Florida Democrats Charlie Crist and Darren Soto voted by proxy the same day as a planned SpaceX launch, but told the House clerk they couldn't vote in person because of the pandemic. Should voters be frustrated, irritated if they find out their member has been voting remotely while fundraising, while on a boat in Florida. Is that something they should be worried about? But I don't think they should automatically assume that just because their 
member has been voting by proxy, their member hasn't been working. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is extending proxy voting through the end of the year. Her office telling ABC News, while some have misused proxy voting for non-pandemic reasons, it remains a vital protection for the health of members who may be immunocompromised or be particularly at risk for life-threatening complications from COVID. All across the country, people are getting back to work. Uh, oh, schools are opening up again. Congress ought to be working. An option to vote remotely in Congress still controversial and unprecedented. Figuring out how to protect the process for people who genuinely need it and while also preventing abuse is going to be a real challenge for an extremely polarized and partisan House of Representatives going forward. As Americans return to work and expect their representatives to do the same. For ABC News, I'm Devin Dwyer on Capitol Hill. Lots of contradictions from some there. Our thanks to Devin for that. Still ahead here on Prime. LeBron James dealing with a first in his storied NBA career, and it may not be something that he's proud of after this violent incident. Our journey to Iceland to take you to the world's largest carbon capture plant. Why what happens here could be key to slowing the effects of climate change. And there may be fewer Americans in our future, we'll explain by the numbers, but first our tweet of the day from 1400 light years away, according to the Hubble telescope, they call it a flame nebula. Drum roll please, tomorrow morning on GMA. Welcome to the best party ever. The Dancing with the Stars after party. Yes, the Mirrorball champions and all the final couples will be jetting overnight to Times Square to party on. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Let's party, people. Don't miss the Good Morning America dancing after party. Get ready to dance. Is the getting steamy in here? Wow. Tomorrow only on Good Morning, America. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Yes, mornings may look different these days, but where you start your day, where you spend your mornings, where you get connected to everything that's happening. And face it, there's a whole lot happening in our world these days. Where you get all the breaking new information of the day to help you navigate through these times. That's why we're here. Good morning, sunshine. And making sure you start your day off with a smile and some sunshine. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Oh, how I love saying that. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. When that man focuses his attention on you, the world stops. That's really flattering because you're beautiful. what being live is Freedom, all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people. No squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not them. afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Welcome back, everyone. We turn now to the U.S. birth rate, which has been in decline now for years. And now a new survey suggests that this trend is likely to continue, if not accelerate. We take a look by the numbers. The U.S. birth rate has dropped for the sixth straight year in a row, and except for one year, has been steadily declining since 2008. U.S. births fell precipitously during the pandemic. Nearly 8% fewer babies were born in December of 2020 than in December of 2019, according to the census. Now a new survey by Pew finds that more adults say they do not plan to have kids. 44% of non-parents ages 18 to 49 said it's not too likely or not at all likely that they'll have children someday. That's up seven percentage points from when they asked the same question in 2018. The most cited reason not to have children was simply 
they just don't want to have them. 56% said this, and that number was about the same for men and women. There were, of course, other reasons that people said they didn't plan to have children. For 19%, it was medical issues. 17% cited financial concerns, and 15% said it's because they don't have a partner. Also, 5% said that they didn't plan to have children because of environmental concerns, including climate change. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. Holiday shopping season is just about in full swing, but what kind of deal should we be looking out for? And the nation that now believes octopuses, lobsters, and crabs are capable of experiencing pain and suffering and therefore need to be protected. The first to look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, the darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money, that's all we do. Be really careful. Someone needs to go public. This is my real life we're talking about. And I'm scared. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The hunt. True crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. The hottest news in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is what being live is Three all seconds. about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people news. squeezing into this bomb shelter. shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Oh, this is the moment. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. The driver of an SUV that plowed into a Christmas parade in Waukesha, Wisconsin yesterday was leaving the scene of a domestic dispute which had taken place moments earlier. Last night, people of Waukesha were gathered to celebrate the start of a season of hope and togetherness and Thanksgiving. This morning, Jill and I and the entire Biden family, and I'm sure all of us pray that that same spirit's gonna embrace and lift up all the victims of this tragedy. At least five people died and more than 40 injured. The Milwaukee Dancing Grannies posted on its Facebook page that two of its members were among the dead, calling those lost extremely passionate grannies. The tragedy top of mind as New York City prepares to bring back the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade three days from now. It's tragic and horrible what happened in Wisconsin, but I will tell you, uh, NYPD for years and years uh, has planned for very careful security. 
Joe Exotic is changing prison facilities after receiving a cancer diagnosis. Joseph Maldonado Passage has been transferred to a federal medical center in Buter, North Carolina for treatment of his prostate cancer. The former Oklahoma zookeeper made famous by the Netflix show Tiger King is serving time for trying to hire two different men to kill Florida animal rights activist, Dancing with the Stars contestant and fellow Tiger owner Carol Baskin. She recently sued trying to stop Netflix from airing a second season of the show, but she lost. As for the blonde mullet clad Joe Exotic, his lawyer says he's being treated for a host of issues and adds prison medical care isn't the best and justice is slow. A bloody brawl at the Lakers Pistons game involving superstar LeBron James. And everybody's coming off now. James striking Pistons player Isaiah Stewart hard in the face while jostling for a rebound in the third quarter of last night's game in Detroit. Uh oh, Stewart and LeBron. An enraged Stewart tries to confront James, but he's held back by his teammates and the officials. Look, here goes Stewart. With blood running down his face, the six foot nine Pistons forward breaks free and tries to rush LeBron knocking down a member of the coaching staff. Just as the incident appears to be over, Stewart again runs towards LeBron, knocking down more staff members. I mean, he's out of the game. The NBA announcing it will suspend James for one game without pay, a career first for the superstar, and suspend Stewart for two games without pay. Engineers in New Jersey will need to take a closer look at the structural integrity of a home that partially collapsed after a dump truck crashed into it. Take a look at this. Surveillance video shows the moment the accident happened this morning in Egg Harbor City. You see the truck plow into the front of the house, triggering a massive white cloud of smoke. Police say the truck and another car had collided. That caused the truck driver to then slam into the house. No word on any injuries or conditions at this time. If you like to eat crabs, lobsters, and octopuses, brace yourself for some guilt. Your food might have feelings. The UK government announced that after a review of 300 studies, decapods and cephalopods will now fall under the Animal Welfare Sentience Bill. They define sentience as having the capacity to have feelings such as pain, pleasure, hunger, thirst, warmth, joy, comfort, and excitement. The UK bill already recognized all animals with a backbone as sentient beings. The bottom line, the report recommends banning the declawing of crabs, the sale of live crabs and lobsters to the untrained, and employing electrical stunning before boiling alive or dismemberment. Actor Kevin Spacey and his companies have been ordered to pay nearly $31 million to the production company behind the Netflix show House of Cards. An arbitrator found that Spacey breached his contract by violating the company's sexual harassment policy. The production company MRC severed its relationship with Spacey and scrapped a season of the show in 2017 after multiple people came forward to allege a pattern of sexually predatory conduct. Welcome back. Tonight, there are new images of tennis star Peng Shuai, and they are not doing much to ease concerns outside of China about her well-being. State media released these new images showing her smiling in public. The IOC's president also says during a video call Sunday, she insisted she is safe and well and living at her home in Beijing. But a spokeswoman for the Women's Tennis Association says these appearances do not alleviate concerns about her ability to communicate without censorship. As you recall, the tennis star accused a former Chinese government official of sexual assault. And now to the trial of disgraced tech entrepreneur Elizabeth Holmes, founder of Theranos. She's accused of running a massive scheme to defraud investors and a surprise move she's now taking the stand in her own defense. And we're not allowed to bring cameras or audio recordings into court, but we've got the next best thing. The eyes and ears of ABC's Rebecca Jarvis, host of the Dropout podcast. She was in that San Jose courtroom and joins us now. Good evening to you, Rebecca. Today was the second day of Holmes's testimony. Give us a recap of what she's been saying. Hi, Lindsay. Well, it's been fascinating to see Elizabeth Holmes on the stand testifying at her own criminal trial. She talked a lot about her origin story, growing up in Houston, dropping out of Stanford to hope to revolutionize the healthcare industry. And she's talked a lot about the healthcare that she went on to create these devices. She's gone into very significant detail, Lindsay, around the devices for the jury, uh, who's very likely hearing a lot of this terminology for the first time. It can get highly 
technical in the courtroom, and there's been a lot of defining, even spelling of words. At one point, uh, the attorneys for Elizabeth Holmes asked her to spell out a word because it was new to most of the people in the courtroom, Lindsay. Oh, wow. And, and Rebecca Holmes was, of course, well known for her charisma and power of persuasion before everything came crumbling down. How is she coming across on the stand? I would say relaxed. She has a very calm and collected demeanor. When she takes her mask off, which is her right to do when she begins her testimony, she does it with a smile on her face. And one of the things uh, that really stood out to me today in court is that she really keeps that eye contact with her defense attorney. She never stumbles. Nothing flusters her on the stand right now, Lindsay. And what do we know about the defense strategy so far? Well, really, it is a look at Elizabeth Holmes herself. So many of the witnesses we've heard from already in this trial, the 29 government witnesses, have laid out these allegations that Elizabeth Holmes lied to investors with falsified documents, allegations that she misled people about the relationship Theranos had with the Department of Defense, and misled her investors about the relationships her company had with pharmaceutical companies, and did a lot of misleading around the technology itself. What they've done so far at this trial, Lindsay, is laying out the early years of this story when Elizabeth Holmes was this bright-eyed, ambitious young woman who wanted to change the world. That is the story that we've heard so far. But of course, we know this is a story that goes on for many years. She ran Theranos from 2004 to 2018, and we're basically in the time frame of 2010 right now. There is a lot of ground to cover still at this trial. And, and lastly, as you talk about that, the many years still that we have to get to, what's the expected timeline for the rest of the trial? Well, the hope is that we will have something of a verdict before Christmas. The jury, the 12 members of this jury, are not sequestered. They are going about their lives. And there's an acknowledgment among the legal experts I speak to that once you get into the holiday period, you really create issues with people going back home, spending time with families, that potential for hearing something, and then the greater potential for a mistrial. So there's a real desire at this court to get things wrapped up by Christmas that would be a few more weeks of trial and we definitely expect to hear from Elizabeth for the rest of this week that's tomorrow and then into next week as well after Thanksgiving Lindsay Rebecca Jarvis thank you so much and be sure to catch the latest episodes of the dropout Elizabeth Holmes on trial wherever you get your podcasts if you have not headed to the grocery store yet to do your holiday shopping, you might just want to consider avoiding the mad dash altogether in the crowds by doing your shopping online. The online grocery sales business is booming, making $8.1 billion last month alone. Our Becky Worley has some tips on how to save online and on delivery. Goodbye coupon wars and hello delivery discounts. During COVID, grocery delivery has literally been a lifesaver and it's starting to feel like a way of life. So the job now is to streamline savings and keep the deliveries coming. One of the biggest saving strategies is trying to avoid delivery fees. The minimum order size for free delivery varies. Stop and Shop is $60, Publix is $10, and Safeway Albertsons is $30. Now, you can avoid delivery fees with many grocers if you subscribe to their membership service. But unless you're a power user of that particular store, the subscription fee may not make financial sense. Many new players are also entering this space. Right now, that's Aldi. When a new brand enters the market, it means they might be willing to lose money on certain products to gain your business. Check out discounting and free delivery offers. What about coupons? Can you use those for shopping online with delivery? Well, no scissors needed. They're all online now. Take Target. If you go to their deals page, you'll see discounted items, and those price cuts are applied automatically. Finally, for household items like paper products and cleaning supplies, the bulkiness of the items often means they're more expensive online. To get these bulky items delivered, it cost me $18 more than if I'd actually shopped at Costco. It was $106 bucks versus $88. But here's the thing. When have I ever gotten out of Costco for under $200? With delivery, I made no discretionary purchases. And this is the number one way that shopping online for groceries can save you money. There are fewer temptations to buy food on impulse. Online grocery shopping really helps people stick to their shopping list. Thank you, Becky. 
It is almost Thanksgiving, of course, traditionally a time to gather with family and friends, but lots of people are excited about that other holiday tradition, shopping Black Friday and Cyber Monday sales. Here to help us find the best deals is Trey Bodge, smart shopping expert at TrueTrade.com. Welcome back to the show, Trey. Before we get into some great bargains, recently Target announced that they will be closed on Thanksgiving Day along with other large retailers. Will that make a big difference for shoppers? I don't think so. I mean, I think that the people who created a tradition around going shopping in store on Thanksgiving evening will just bring it back home. Um, a lot of the early Black Friday deals will be available online. And so people can sit on their couches with full bellies and do some shopping. So I don't think it'll change much. And what categories do you think that people should focus on over Black Friday and Cyber Monday in particular? So you're going to see deals across a number of categories, but the, my three favorite categories are tech, uh, things like smartphones, tablets, laptops, TVs, and then fall apparel and footwear and beauty. And so if you can't get all of your shopping done over Black Friday, Cyber Monday, if you focus on those three categories, you'll be in good shape. And what offers are you especially excited about this year? So I love tech accessories, especially smartphone accessories, especially because they are more affordable. They're small. Uh, things like Bluetooth speakers and mobile chargers and, uh, you know, AirPods, of course, not inexpensive, but I've been holding off getting them. And I think I'm going to bite the bullet over Black Friday and Cyber Monday. And the other category I really like in the tech category would be small appliances, particularly things for the countertop, like air fryers and then uh, robotic vacuums. I know Amazon's offering $100 off a Roomba. And so if you've ever been curious about a robotic vacuum, now's the time to strike for that. And for something like you mentioned, AirPods, what kind of a discount might we be able to see if we hold out and wait until Black Friday or Cyber Monday? So being realistic, Apple is not that generous with discounts. Um, however, their retailers can have a little bit more wiggle room. And so I would expect maybe $50 off or a little bit more, especially on an older model, you might do even better. Are there any new ways that we can discover products and save money over Cyber Week? I think I think social shopping or live streaming is going to be really exciting. I've been learning about what Facebook and Instagram are doing, and they, they're partnering with both big and small retailers offering live streaming sessions that you can watch and shop directly from. And I think that's pretty exciting, especially for people who are not ready to venture back into the stores. They can still have that kind of real experience shopping. What about after Cyber Weekend? Will there be any good deals left? I think so. So according to Adobe Analytics, really the deepest discounts are found between Black Friday and Cyber Monday. However, right after Cyber Monday is Travel Deal Tuesday, and that is a big, big sale day for travel deals. And then going into December, we have Green Monday, which tends to be a good sale day. That's December 13th. And then there's Free Shipping Day on December 14th. And that's typically when retailers promise on-time shipping for the Christmas holidays. But given uh, sort of foreboding news about shipping delays, I don't know, but a lot of retailers do offer sales on that day. And then the last big sale day is for Saturday, which is the Saturday before Christmas, and that's December 18th. So many dates to mark down on the calendar there. But as a professional shopper, do you have any tips on how to stay organized and sane with so much stress surrounding shopping often? Yeah, I mean, this is going to be a really strange year because of all the supply chain issues and shipping delays. And so it sounds so obvious, but I would really suggest that people get organized, make an actual list, not in your head. Uh, I use the Notes app on my phone. You can list recipients, maybe a budget for each, and a couple of gift ideas, including a sort of a plan A and then a plan B, because you may not be able to get that number one gift that you have on your list. But if you have a plan B all ready to go, it'll be much less stressful. Trey Bodge from TrueTrade.com. Thank you so much for your time. Appreciate all the insight as always. Thanks for having me. Finally tonight, one Iceland company believes its technology can go a long way towards saving tomorrow. The solution, quite literally sucking carbon dioxide out of the sky. Does it work and can it be scaled up in a big enough way to help put an end to the climate crisis? Our Ginger Z traveled to Iceland to find out. Iceland, 
Not only a wondrous nation with so much to offer, but also almost 100% powered by renewables. And in a remote area just 20 miles southeast of the country's capital, Reykjavik, you'll find Helisadi, the largest geothermal power plant in Iceland. So we are standing here in the mossy lava fields, which is actually a volcano. And so we are harnessing the heat from the underground to produce electricity. Part of that emissions-free electricity now powers another nearby climate change fighting machine. Meet Climeworks's Orca. Icelandic for energy. It's the largest direct air carbon capture facility in the world, and it just opened in September. Its giant fans and filters can remove 4,000 tons of CO2 every year. It's all part of a joint project with Iceland's CarbFix, the two companies working together to clean the atmosphere by taking CO2 from the air and turning it into stone. There's no magic, it's a natural process mm -hmm. and very environmentally friendly. Mm -hmm. And it turns the CO2 into stone, uh, like 95% turns into stone in less than two years. So it mineralizes on the stone and then the water is left for the regular reserve. Yeah. The largest quantities of carbon on Earth are already stored in the bedrock underneath us, in minerals and so forth. So what we did was find a way to sort of imitate and speed up this process using science and innovation. And really, Iceland is the ideal place to do this because all of this is being run. If we were running this with coal-fired electricity, it would be so yeah. backward. Yeah, yeah. But this is by geothermal energy. This is energy. geothermal energy. It's renewable energy. And uh, we are here next to the uh, Hedlis the geothermal power plant of ON. And they provide us with the heat and the electricity, renewable electricity that we need. We humans put out nearly 40 billion tons of CO2 just this year, so taking out 4,000 tons is really just a drop in the bucket. They do want to scale this up fast, and here's how it works. Once the carbon is captured, you see those gray pipelines? It is mixed with water, kind of a fizzy water, that travels through those pipes and into these igloo-like structures. Now, once inside the igloo, it is injected a half a mile beneath the Earth's surface. This is a more or less an oversized soda stream machine. It makes carbonated water and this is what we inject into the bedrock. The carbonated water is pumped into the ground. There, it's released into the volcanic basalt rock. It mineralizes in less than two years. Both companies say what happens in Iceland does not have to stay in Iceland. We're getting more and more interest, and we are speaking of scaling this up to millions and hundreds of millions and eventually billions of tons over the next 30 years. At that scale, it could make a huge dent in the rapid warming of our planet. A number of, of technologies that we have to bring to scale rapidly, but the good news is that those technologies exist, so we have to get to work and do it. Fascinating technology there, our thanks to Ginger Z. And before we go tonight, the image of the day, take a look at this. It shows a swimmer with some incredibly thick skin or blood or something because they are taking laps in a partially frozen lake despite the fact that it is snowing. This was at a park in northeastern China feel cold just looking at that. That is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thank you so much for streaming with us. next hour, that big holiday week storm that we feared last week never really materialized. So now with that out of the way, it's time to focus on Black Friday or perhaps some deals that are online now. And Outlander fans, listen up. The ninth book is out and we're sitting down with the author. Stay with us. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. Hello. There was no question that Southern California was in a state of panic. You have serial killers literally all over the city. This was an ideal killing field for anyone who wanted to get away with these crimes. We would always say, my God, please, not another one. It's been 44 years since these murders. I have dreams about victims. And I wake up in the middle of the night and say, don't open that door. Underneath all of that sunshine, there was the darkest of the dark. It was a very scary time. People panicking that their daughter's going to be the next victim. It was just unbelievable. 
there were so many murders happening, you had to have a name for it. Serial killer. Hillside Strangler, Freeway Killer, Sunset Strip Killers, Toolbox Killers, Skid Row Stabber. L.A. became the serial killer capital of the world. This was premeditated evil. No other motive or reason except they like to kill. Like a sound what rose out of that was LAPD's robbery homicide unit. We had no computers, no DNA, no technology. You got a job to do, get your hands dirty. It's me against the killer. It's a competition. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Every other day, they were finding a body. And the killing somehow got even worse. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. There was a human head in there. That's when people really started saying, hey, you know what? Now we're not safe. this clock, this person that you're hunting is going to do this again if you can't catch them. Nobody deserves to die like that. We should try not to remember the killers, but to remember their victims. You know, someday I thought this would be over, but uh, it never will be. Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. Hi there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour, including the damning report against the former governor of New York, Andrew Cuomo. A state assembly committee investigation found, quote, overwhelming evidence that Cuomo engaged in multiple cases of sexual harassment, sexual misconduct, and created a toxic work environment. Lawmakers are calling this latest revelation extremely disturbing. President Biden will let Federal Reserve Chairman and Trump appointee Jerome Powell keep his job. The president announcing that he'll nominate him for a second four-year term, citing what he calls steady and decisive leadership during the pandemic. Biden added that Powell is the right person to handle the growing threat of inflation. And more than 70 years later, a Florida judge has officially exonerated four black men falsely accused of rape. They were known as the Groveland Four and were accused of raping a 17-year-old white woman in 1949. But the state now says the evidence against them was false. Sadly, two of those men were fatally shot and the other two were sentenced to life in prison. All four have now passed away. In just seconds, an event kicking off the Christmas season became a crime scene. The driver, possibly fleeing another crime, drove a vehicle into a holiday parade route near Milwaukee. Now there are children in critical condition, according to officials at Children's Wisconsin. Alex Perez has the latest from Waukesha. Tonight, horrifying new images showing that SUV swerving through the crowd in Waukesha, Wisconsin, ramming into members of a marching band at the Christmas parade. Oh my God! Get out the way! Maroon Ford escapes his blue bike while heading into the parade road. From holiday smiles to indescribable fear, these images from above showing entire families, children, and participants like the dancing grannies desperately trying but unable to escape the vehicle's path. There's like seven injured that way. There's so many down there. Matthew Rood was with his two girls, ages two and five. Seconds before the incident, they wanted some of the candy being handed out. She said, Daddy, can I go get that piece of candy? And I said, no, honey, you stay by me. I don't go past this line, OK? And there's a reason why I said that, OK? And not even a minute later, that's exactly where the SUV drove by. I can't find her! Person after person mowed down, five people killed, at least 48 injured, including 18 children, six still in critical condition. There was just like so many like bodies in the road um, and then I saw them like start to pick them up and they were like little kids. Terrified many screaming for loved ones. Aiden! Aiden! For more than a third of a mile down Main Street that vehicle slamming into people. Dan Schneiderman's record shop is on the parade route. About 60 people ran in to seek refuge. He helped to perform first aid on some of the injured. I literally saw 
roughly 10 people bounce off of that car and and you could hear thud 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 as he drove through that and you could hear it uh, which is a sound I'll never forget. Authorities tonight identifying the driver of that SUV as 39 year old Daryl Brooks arrested and charged with five counts of first degree intentional homicide. Officials say just back on November 2nd, Brooks was accused of using what appears to be the same vehicle to run over the mother of his child. Investigators believe before the parade incident, he was fleeing another crime scene, possibly a domestic disturbance. Police say he was not being pursued when he rammed the parade barricades and and unleashed havoc. I want to identify the victims that we've at that we know of at this time. And I see this with great sorrow. The police chief emotional as he identified the victims and described those who helped. Minutes after an incident occurred, I responded to the scene and what I saw out of chaos and tragedy was heroes. Tonight, authorities identifying those tragically killed, four women and one man, ages 52 to 81. Among them, Tammy Durand, her husband tonight telling ABC News her memory will bring joy to all who knew her. Our thanks to Alex for that. Now to the closing arguments in the Ahmad Arbery case. The prosecutor told the jury that the three men shot and killed Arbery simply because he was a black man running. The defense, though, says it was self-defense and that Travis McMichael, who pulled the trigger, feared for his life. Here's ABC's Steve Osinsami. One of the first things the prosecutor drove home as she began her closing arguments today is that the issue of color really mattered. And they made their decision to attack Ahmaud Arbery in their driveways because he was a black man running down the street. She said it was three on one with their guns and pickup trucks versus an unarmed young black man who wasn't even carrying a cell phone or a wallet. If you are the initial unjustified aggressor, you don't get to claim self-defense. Defense lawyers told jurors that this killing was self-defense because when they look at this same disturbing cell phone video from that sunny February day nearly two years ago, they see the victim trying to overpower their client and take his gun. And so he's done what he thinks the law allows him to do, which is to try to de-escalate that approach by showing force. Showing force necessary to prevent Travis himself or his father from getting beaten and possibly killed. Travis McMichael, who fired the fatal shots, his father Gregory McMichael, who was also armed that day, and their neighbor William Roddy Bryan, who police say joined the chase and recorded the video, have all pleaded not guilty. They're hoping that they've convinced jurors that they were making a citizen's arrest under then Georgia law. But prosecutors told jurors that the law requires the men to have immediate knowledge of something that Ahmaud Arbery did wrong, and none of them saw him steal anything at the neighborhood construction site. Our thanks to Sivo Sinsami. And joining us now is Alex Forche, who's been on the ground for the trial since the start. Alex, the judge is moving the jury so they're not disturbed by the scene outside the courthouse. What have things been like there? Well, Lindsay, we've seen a much different crowd outside the courthouse today than in days past. Uh, you remember last Thursday, we had hundreds of pastors and faith leaders that came here to Brunswick to show their support for the Arbery family. Well, today, it was a much different audience. We saw members of the new Black Panther Party uh, marching here. They had weapons and uh, tactical gear, and they marched around the courthouse. And while the judge says that things have been peaceful, there haven't been any threats. It was enough of a commotion that he could hear. And so because of that, they want to move the jury to an internal deliberation room. And Alex, the defense attacking Arbery personally today. Talk to us about their argument. Well, Lindsay, for the duration of this trial, we've seen the defense attorneys, specifically for Gregory and Travis McMichael, walk a really thin line in trying to humanize their defendants without criticizing uh, Ahmaud Arbery during, uh, during this trial. But defense attorney Hogue, who spoke on behalf of Gregory McMichael during her closing arguments, uh, pointed out things that she thought that made Arbery uh, kind of victim blaming, if you will. And, and there was one comment in particular where she talked talked about his long, dirty, uh, 
toenails. And that was something that specifically uh, upset Ahmaud Arbery's mother, Wanda Cooper Jones, who was in the courtroom uh, during much of today's proceedings. She said, wow, and then got up and left. We know that it's something that's, uh, that's really kind of bothered the family this, uh, this evening. Uh, and it's something that's uh, definitely going to be on the minds of, of the jury going into these deliberations. And lastly, there are, of course, a lot of uncertainties. But when do we expect that the trial will wrap up? Well, it, it, everything here is fluid, right? But so we know that the prosecution has at least two hours at the start tomorrow. Court's going to start about 30 minutes early, but they have two hours uh, of final closing arguments to get through. And then the jury is going to be handed uh, those charging documents and they'll begin deliberations. We assume that they'll at least go a half day, possibly on Wednesday. Um, so we're looking at if they don't come back quickly, maybe this going until Friday or possibly possibly, possibly early next week. Alex Perchet, our thanks to you. Millions of Americans are getting ready to hit the road, the rails, or the air on their way to a Thanksgiving holiday destination. The number of travelers is actually expected to approach pre-pandemic demand, but with cases of COVID-19 on the rise, health officials are stressing the priority of getting shots administered to those who are still unvaccinated. ABC's Dan Lieberman has the latest. The Sunday after Thanksgiving is expected to be the single busiest travel day of the year, with an estimated 2.4 million passengers. The TSA already reporting a record number of travelers on Friday, more than 2.2 million people, with about 70% of Americans planning to spend the holidays with family and friends from outside their own home. Dr. Anthony Fauci giving his okay with some preconditions. If you're vaccinated, and hopefully you'll be boosted too, and your family is, you can enjoy a typical Thanksgiving meal. People who are not vaccinated, they're the major source of the infection in the community. This, as Biden administration officials confirm ahead of today's vaccine mandate deadline, that more than 90% of federal workers have had at least one shot, with 93% of TSA workers now in compliance. Despite fears that the mandate will lead to staff shortages disrupting holiday travel, U.S. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg on NBC's Meet the Press telling people not to worry. If people aren't getting immediately pulled off of their posts. Uh, it's part of a process to make sure that everyone in the federal workforce is safe. And the CDC making its recommendation last week that all adults 18 and older get a booster shot at least six months after their second dose of Pfizer or Moderna vaccines or two months after the single dose of the J&J &J vaccine. With state governors in New Mexico and Connecticut saying they now consider fully vaccinated to include a booster shot. But Dr. Fauci and the White House saying fully vaccinated still means two doses of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine or one dose of the J&J &J vaccine. We'll continue to follow the data because right now, when we're boosting people, what we're doing, following them, we're gonna see what the durability of that protection is. Our thanks to Dan for that. Next tonight to the Louisiana community still struggling to recover months after Hurricane Ida. And also tonight facing the question head on that a growing number of communities are having to deal with is the effects of human induced climate change take hold. Should you even rebuild at all in the same area? Our Rob Marciano traveled 80 miles south of New Orleans to meet residents and communities struggling with this difficult decision. The Mississippi Delta still struggling with the aftermath of Hurricane Ida more than two months later. Boats flipped on their sides, businesses gone, homes stacked in piles. This is Sandra Nakin's home. She's been living here for 50 years, but now she's one of Louisiana's so-called climate refugees, making a painful move. Heartbroken. Because <sighs> the grandkids wouldn't be able to come down here and enjoy the, this beautiful land. We're just going to have to keep it in our hearts, I guess. The place she called home is an island 80 miles southwest of New Orleans. And now it's being swallowed up by the Gulf of Mexico. This is Island Road, the only road in and out of Ile de Jean Charles. And it's routinely shut down in storm flooding. So they're trying to build it up using heavy equipment. But it's one of many low-lying roads here in Louisiana that is losing the battle against climate change. Climate scientist Alex Coker believes global sea level rise is endangering Ile de Jeune Charles. We are partially at the mercy of what 
everyone else around the world does in terms of climate change. Louisiana's climate forecast predicts sea levels could rise nearly two and three quarters feet in the next 50 years. The rate at which we're sinking is a good analog for how rising waters will affect the rest of the country in the middle of the century. In 2016, the government started a program to resettle these climate migrants off Ile de June Charles to higher ground. Some residents and business owners here are deciding to stay. Most of them are Native American with roots dating back centuries. Your ancestors were basically driven south mm -hmm. uh, with, with settlements coming in and to the edge of Louisiana, and now, right. now the edge is retreating. Right, yeah. We're running out of land for our people to run to. Our last village was burnt, and so the people fled to the bayous. So now we, we learn how to survive, we learn how to fish, shrimp, and now they want us out. Our elders, this is their home. It's always been their home and they really can't afford to go nowhere else. That was my kitchen right here. That's my back porch. Dominic Dardar and his brother Edison are part of that lineage, fighting to stay in Il de June Charles, even after Ida demolished their home. This is my home, and I was born, born and raised here. My daddy lived all his life here, so I'm gonna leave mine. Though the brothers plan to stay, a once beautiful paradise many called home is slowly becoming a fading memory. If we give up on a place like this, does that mean that we'll have to give up on Norfolk or Boston or Los Angeles? Because a lot of those other places aren't that far behind us. Our thanks to Rob for that. And now to your money. Black Friday is just days away. And even with soaring inflation and an ongoing shipping crisis, Americans are expected to spend 13% more than last year. Here's ABC's Ariel Reshef with some deals you can get right now. Tonight, the clock is ticking down to Black Friday, but the deals are already up for grabs. At Target, this KitchenAid stand mixer normally goes for $430, but now it's $220. This Apple Watch, which normally retails for $280, is on sale at Best Buy for $220. And at Kohl's, this Roomba vacuum, originally $375, now on sale for $190, plus an additional 15% off at checkout. Experts predict consumers will spend about $998 on average on gifts this year, about 13% more than last year. Big box retailers are already in set for supply chain issues. Small mom and pop retailers, not so much. But unlike years past, experts say holding out for better deals isn't always the best move. The demand is going to increase for product as we get closer to the holiday. So when there's short supply of product and demand increases, the price increases. Ariel Reshev joins us now. Ariel, Target and other big box stores now announcing that they'll be closed on Thanksgiving Day. What will that mean for shoppers? Well, Lindsay, these big box retailers are saying that it is now becoming more lucrative for them to have these sales online. So we may not see as many people flooding the stores on Black Friday as we've seen in years past. Lindsay. Ariel Russia, our thanks to you. All right, calling all Outlander fans out there. The author of the book series is about to release her long-awaited ninth book, Go Tell the Bees That I Am Gone. ABC's Kaylee Hartung sat down with her for the inside scoop about the book and the hit show. What happens when you mix time travel, historical fiction, and a love story for the ages? You get the phenomenon called Outlander. The hit star show based on author Diana Gabaldon's wildly popular novels that have been translated into 38 different languages and sold over 50 million copies across 114 countries. And now fans are buzzing with excitement over Gabaldon's long-awaited ninth Outlander novel, Go Tell the Bees That I Am Gone. And this will be at home. The American Revolution threatens to tear apart time-crossed lovers Jamie and Claire. All of my books have a shape. I think in geometrical shapes. This book is shaped like a snake and uh, it has coils of the loops of different people's stories that keep coming back. And uh, the beginning of this story is not the snake's head, <laughs> it's the tail. You wrote your first book for practice. I did. Not yeah. thinking anyone would read it. Now, 
Does practice make perfect? Nine books in? Well, I'd like to hope I'm getting better, you know? <laughs> People always say, which one is your favorite book? And I say, it's the one I'm working on, because <laughs> this is the one where I don't know everything yet. I wake up every day and I find that I love you more than I did the day before. The first book could be called A Romance because it is a courtship story. And I said, you know, it seems obvious what makes people fall in love. I said, I've never seen anyone literarily uh, try to tell a story explaining why people stay in love. What does it take to be married for 50 years? Responsibility is the mm -hmm. word you, you, you've used to characterize this book. What did you mean by that? Well, people hold a lot of different responsibilities in their lives, especially in times of stress, war, you know, famine, etc. Someone's got to lead, you know, and uh, how, how do you do that? Claire, for instance, is a healer. This is what she does. And Jamie, on the other hand, he's a warrior. He's a leader. He feels responsible for everybody all of the time. <laughs> Droughtlander is nearly over, with season six of the show, which Gabaldon consults on, set to premiere early next year. Can you give fans anything to look forward to? They're going to enjoy season six, I can tell you that much. It's a terrific season. Uh, they were able to keep very, very closely to the book story, which will please all of the book readers. And it's a very exciting part of the story, which will please all of the show-only readers and so forth. But uh, our actors have truly come into their own. They were always great, but you know, they, and they're like the books. They get better with each succeeding season. It's almost here. Our thanks to Kaylee for that. Lots of excitement and still to come. How do you make that Thanksgiving trip as pleasant as possible? A few tips when we come back. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pow. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Christopher Steele, the guy who picked a fight with two presidents, and he's lived to tell the tale. That now infamous dossier. Supposedly a tape showing prostitutes hired by Donald Trump urinating on a bed. and would be quite a tape if it in fact existed. I said take out the PP tape. It quickly became a question of how much of this was accurate. This is the stuff of movies. A lot of this is the stuff of movies. The story of epic proportions. Phony stuff. It's a bunch of crap. It changed history. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pow. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. This is American history, a violent white mob, a brutal attack, 300 black Americans killed right here in America. Now, it is time to uncover Tulsa's buried truth, the gripping story brought to light in a new podcast from ABC News, available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. We will look at what has been happening this week. And we'll talk about it later on the roundtable. Good morning and welcome to this week. Good morning and welcome to this week. Good morning and welcome to this week. Historic. Join us Sunday morning celebrating 40 years of ABC's This Week. ABC News. Honored. Winner of nine Edward R. Murrow Awards. More than any other network. Including winning the award for overall excellence in both television and radio. ABC News is America's number one news source. Now with so much on the line, more Americans are turning to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight than any other program across all of television. Welcome back, everyone. We are tracking several headlines from around the world. Former soldier and Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed is headed to the battlefront to personally help lead the fight in the country's ongoing civil war. Ahmed, who won a Nobel Peace Prize just two years ago, released a statement where he said, quote, this is a time when leading a country with martyrdom is needed. Tens of thousands have already been killed in the fight between Ethiopian and allied forces and fighters from the Tigray region. There have been days of violent protests 
protests in the streets of the French territory of Guadalupe over COVID regulations. People in the French door territory, which is located in the Caribbean, led to burn down buildings and cars along with damaged storefronts. Fears of ongoing violence led schools to actually close on Monday. Several dozen people were also arrested. And lastly, one could say that things in Ontario, Canada, are up in smoke after Uber Technologies announced that they will allow users to place orders for cannabis via their Uber Eats app. The service, which launched today, is working with a retailer so customers can pick up their orders at a nearby location. Uber claims the partnership will help Canadian adults make their purchases more safely. It is, of course, holiday travel season, the time of the year when we get to reconnect with family and hope that nothing derails us along the way. And to that point, Will Gans has a few tips. What is the season for major airport <laughs> meltdowns? The travel industry lost 8.2 million jobs between March and April 2020, and those jobs are only slowly returning. So with fewer and newer employees there to help you along the holiday road, some tips to make sure your trip is five star. Embrace tech this year. Most hotels also now allow you to check in online. You have to download their app. And what's really cool is you can use their app often as a mobile key. So you don't even need to get a key from the front desk. You can just hold your phone up to the door and never have to talk to a person at check-in. This is a vacation. You can also trim down on security wait times with apps like Clear, which use biometric data and allow you to skip to the front of the line. There is a right way and a wrong way to complain should something go wrong. Break that down for us, Sally. I actually recommend turning to social media rather than sit on hold. I did call their customer service line and they said it would be two hours on hold. Uh, I didn't want to listen to hold music, so I actually just tweeted at Southwest and a customer service agent responded to me via Twitter. They were able to get me on a different flight. They were able to give me a flight voucher. And that whole transaction happened through my Twitter DMs. And just in case. Understand if there's airports nearby, if your airport suddenly cancels your flight, can you fly out of one that's a half an hour drive away? Um, bring a backup plan with you because you might actually need it. Headphones too. Oh, Tweeting the airline directly, that is a really helpful tip. Our thanks to Will for that. And that is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. World News Now. And America This Morning. The best new video. The breaking news overnight. Emergency crews called to the town of Surfside. U.S. airstrikes hitting targets in Iraq and Syria. The stories people are talking about. If you don't want to shave your legs, don't. I was going to say. Oh, my. Got it. And what to expect in the day ahead. ABC World News Now and America This Morning. Starting at 2 a.m. Eastern. Up all night to keep you up to date. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. See why Sunday mornings, more and more Americans are now turning first to ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos. Welcome to This Week.